Let's, uh, let's pray together and we'll get started. God, we're thankful for the way that you love us. And we just pray for a truth to come forth in this, through this message this morning, Lord, that we would trust you, that we would trust in your strength, um, in your wisdom, in the glorious riches of your grace, and that you would show yourself kind to us today as we come under your word. Um, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we are in Second Peter. Or, we're in First Peter. Uh, that's what your um, worship folder says, but not this week. And um, the reason for that was, is you know, as you guys know, last week had a little bit of a rough week, and um, and so decided to take a little bit of break from that. But beginning next week, we'll be back in First Peter chapter three, um, beginning in verse eight. So if you want to, you know, jump back in there, read ahead, uh, kind of prepare you for next week. But this week. Um, I wanted to look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. I'm going to read it to you, and um, and it's for us to consider today. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It's God's word, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Um, And I think one of the reasons that this passage has been on my heart this week is, as you guys know, got COVID last week. Also got a nice little addition to COVID uh, in the form of idiopathic inflammatory myopathy, um, (laughs) which basically um, is an immune response, an aggressive immune response that causes uh, the weakening of your muscles in your um, legs and in your arms. So my, my, my legs are much better. Um, so Monday, I was, you know how you can kind of take your you know, knee up and pull it up to your chest. I could get my knee right here. About That's as far as I could get it. Um, and, um, you know, couldn't make a fist with my, with my arms and my hands. And it made just little things very difficult to do. Um, one of the most frustrating things is, you know how you can kind of take your, your thumb and your finger and you put it right here and you you know, your belt and just pull up your pants a little bit? Well, if you're a bigger guy like me, there's a perpetual war being waged between your gut and your, um, and your pants right there. And so your gut always wants to push your pants down, right? So you kind of need your thumbs and your fingers to get in on the action and kind of pull up here, you know, and do your thing. So, you know, my pants, I couldn't pull my pants up. Couldn't open a, a soda, couldn't open the bathroom drain to drain out water from the, from the bathtub or ride or anything like that. But um, it did give me some time to kind of think and, and consider. And, um, you know, I thank the Lord for medicine and for good doctors. And so I was on a steroid treatment and, I've, you know, I'm probably at 80% now. So I can still, I can like pick up a book and use my thumbs, right? And I can pull up my pants. And so I've... I don't have anything to complain. I know. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a God. And he, you know, he, he likes for me to have my pants up. Um, (laughs) But, um, but, you know, this, 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 this text, I think is always kind of close at hand, especially when you're kind of confronted with, I think the reality of things. Um, And this is something that if, if you read the Bible and you just, I think you learn it too, as you pastor and you, and you deal with, and, and you walk with people through every stage of life. And what you see is that ultimately, most of us are heading to a place, right? And, and we don't think about it because if you look at the demographics of this congregation, most of you are young. Most of us are young. Um, but what happens is, 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 is we get older, the bodies that God gives us that, that, you, that bring us so much pleasure now, think of all the pleasure that you can get from your body. Some of you can run, you work out, um, you, you go on weekend trips, you can, you can buy, you can sell, go antiquing, eat, go to a restaurant, go out to whatever. One day, right, the, the body that we use to bring us so much pleasure, um, it actually becomes the vehicle of pain and disappointment. Um, it, it turns on you, all right? And then you're confronted with the reality that what I once used to get pleasure from now is just the source of, of frustration because I can't do the things that I used to do. Um, I can't get the enjoyment that I used to get. And, and that usually for most people is a decline as, 
as, as they age. And, and we're confronted with the realities that these bodies aren't, they, they don't last forever apart from being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and, and being replaced in the new heaven and the new earth with bodies that will last forever. And I think that's probably one of the cruelest um, parts of being a human if you don't have uh, if you don't have Christ, is that the body that, that God gives us, that one gives us so much pleasure, um, suddenly becomes the vehicle of so much pain and disappointment. And if you don't lose your health, um, you lose mental awareness. You see people, they, they grow older and they, um, and they deal with debilitating diseases of the brain. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a sober reality to, to think about, right? But this is our plight as, as humans. This is actually the direction where we, where we go. And as our, as our physical body, our outward body wastes away and perishes, the thing that we hope happens as we grow closer and closer to Christ is that inside our inner person is being renewed day by day into the image and the likeness of Christ. And so as the body dwindles, faith, faith rises. And so when you look at the Apostle Paul and some of the people in the New Testament and, and they're dealing with their own stuff, we're all dealing with our own stuff, I think passages like Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 become really, really precious to him. And we're going to look at that today. And hopefully they'll be precious to us as well. So if you are in perfect health, some of you look really good. You know what I mean? Looking at you. No, no, I was looking at Nick. Yeah. I was like, you know, at, <laughs> Nick looks real nice on the front row there. Real, real fit. Some of you, some of us look really nice, Nick. Some of us, some of you other ones, you know, as you tell. But anyway, no matter where you are, um, hopefully you'll, you'll take stock in this. And so if something happens and you're trying to accept where you are, and it's not where you want to be, it's, it's a little bit easier. So here's some observations. Actually, just two from Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. This is the sermon this morning. So there's really not much to it. Um, somebody looked at me and they said, well, I'm sure you'll fill it in. I said, it's kind of like my clothes, you know? You look at your clothes. Now listen, you look at your clothes and you're like, oh, look, you know, it's just their clothes. There's what, what's there? And then you, when you put them on, you always fill them in. And so that's what a sermon outline is. It's always like clothes. You, doesn't matter how, you know, how much or little there is, you always fill them in. So here's the first one, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, uh, the first observation. And it's, God is greater than the sum of human wisdom, strength, and wealth. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Rather, so there's the, on the other end of it, let him who boasts, boast in this that he understands and knows me. And so one of the things that this passage implies is that um, it's, it's folly to boast in strength, in wealth, and in wisdom because God is, is greater than the sum of humanity's strength and wealth and wisdom. When you see it in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25, when Paul says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is is stronger than men. And so what this passage, is, passage means is when God's as foolish as he can be, all right, so think about this. When God is as foolish as an infinitely um, wise God can be, and we are as wise as we can be. So when we hit the apex of wisdom and God hits the apex of foolishness, God is wiser in his foolishness than we are in our wisdom. That's what this text says. So when God goes to the depths of foolishness, even when he's there, and we rise to the height of our wisdom, he is infinitely more wise in his foolishness than we are in our wisdom. And the same can be said with strength, right? The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So when God is as weak as he can possibly be, when God is as weak as an infinitely powerful God can be, and we are as strong as humans as, as we can be, we, we reach the, hum, the apex of cumulative strength, right? Think about it as humanity's cumulative strength, not just yours, yours added to everyone else's, right? When, when we reach the apex of our cumulative strength and God as, is as weak as he can be, he is stronger in his weakness than we are in our strength. So God is greater than the sum of human wisdom, of human strength, and of human wealth. And therefore, according to Paul, according to the book of Jeremiah, he is worthy 
of our boasting. And um, that's, that, that's a good thing. And, and, and one of the reasons it's a good thing is because what it, what it, what it implies then is, is this. Nowhere in the Bible or in God's word or in the life of Christ does God ask us to be any of the things, any of these things that, that he is? God doesn't ask you to be strong in his place. He, he doesn't ask you to figure this out, be wise in, in his place. He doesn't ask you to utilize all of your wealth and, 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 and mobilize it to accomplish some sort of good, some sort of humanitarian good in his, in his place. He, he doesn't do any of those things. Instead, what, what God does is he says, he says, this is who I am. I'm infinitely wise, strong, and resourceful, right? I mean, because that's, when we talk about the, the strong man boasting in his strength or the rich man boasting in his riches or the wise man boasting in his wisdom, what, what, is, what does that mean? Is it like, you know, is it like Eric sending up because he goes to, you know, and does jumping jacks with these men in the morning at 5 a.m. or Jacob, you know, like one, two, you know, like, look, hey, look how str- <laughs> Or, you know, or, or Nick, you know, Nick, his big biceps. Is that what he's, is that what we're, t- that's not, think of it in terms, in these terms, like, you know, you watch these old movies, like, he boasts of an army of 10,000 horsemen. You know, what's he saying? Is that this, this king has 10,000 infantry, and he is going to use that strength. He is going to um, mobilize that strength in order to accomplish an aim or in order to accomplish a purpose. All right, that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about boasting in wisdom, boasting in strength, or boasting in money. We're talking about the almost unknowing propensity in every person to take what they have at their disposal, whether it's strength whether it's cunning, whether it's finances, and to mobilize those things in a way that work for our benefit or to accomplish a purpose. That's the benefit of being strong. That's one of the benefits of being wealthy. That's one of the benefits of being wise is that you can use things inherent in yourself, right, to change a situation or to make something happen or to set yourself up for a brighter future or to get yourself out of a jam, right? What, we're, what we have at at the heart of this is a self-reliant person who boasts in all the things that, in, in, that he uses to manifest his self-reliance unknowingly, right, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a God-besotted person who actually begins to live the life of Christ and to accept the things as they, as they are under the sovereignty of God, under the hand of God, and doesn't try to squirm or work their way out of a situation by, by taking inherent attributes that are positive and mobilizing them for their own good. And, and this, is, um, this is kind of a hard lesson to learn because I think we're, we're wired this way, right? We're wired to be self-sufficient. We're wired to be the people that answer our own problems or to fix our own problems or to you know, we're not necessarily wired to accept the things as they are and, and be through, that, through the weakness that we embody in Christ, have the power of God manifest itself through our weakness as, as the vehicle that actually changes things. So we push and we prod and we pull, we force, we fight, we fuss with each other, right? Right? We do, we do all the things in order to get the thing that we want because that's how we've been taught. That's how you get what you want. And that's why you have people that are manipulators. Have anybody been dating somebody that's a manipulator? That's what, that's what they do. They use the wisdom of manipulation in order to get the thing that they want. Um, strength, you can overpower somebody, whatever. So that's just, that's the way we function as people in our natural state. And one of the miracles of Christianity is that it calls us away from that state, right? It calls people like me and you who want to push 
and who want to shove and who want to force and make things happen, right, for ourselves in God's name. It calls us away from that. And it calls us into a place of where we have to learn to accept the things that seem weak. We have to accept the situations that seem like we should not accept. And in accepting those situations and in, in not trying, what you begin to find is that the thing that you once strove and tried to accomplish actually manifests itself when you let go of it. Um, and and that's, that's kind of a, a difficult thing to to look at and to learn. But that's, that's one of the problems with healthy arms and hands is that um, they want to do all the lifting. <laughs> right? The problem with healthy arms and hands is they can pull up their own waist. You know, they don't have to do anything about the battle between the gut and the waistline, you know? They just pull up their own pants. Um, that's the problem with wealth and riches is that it becomes... Um, wealth inherently becomes the ultimate obstacle to knowing God because everything that God offers, you, uh, you can purchase for yourself. That's why Jesus says you can't serve God and mammon. And then he says, why do you worry about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear? You, you can't serve God and mammon. God and money are, are naturally diametrically opposed to one another because you serve God in the way you serve money. How do you serve money? You don't serve money by pouring into a cup of coffee. You serve money by putting money to work for you. That's how you serve money. And investors say that all the time, right? Let's make your money work for you. That's the definition of serving money. Scripture talks about serving God in a similar way. No eye has seen or ear heard a God who works for those who wait for him, right? And so when we serve money, what we do is we put it in a place and have that money and the distribution of it and the saving of it, we have it meet every single need we have, right? Now, opposed to that is this idea that we take God and we, we trust in him and we don't fight and we don't strive for money. Rather, we look to God and we say, okay, God, I'm sick, I need healing. I'm poorly clothed. I need clothing. I'm hungry. I need food. Money can buy you. Money goes and money says, hey, 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 hey. I can buy you all those things. Comfort, air conditioning, food, clothing, medicine, all from God, right? But what happens in the fallen human heart is we begin to trust and rely on it, Right? And instead of using that as a means that God might give us to actually purchase the medicine, we begin to trust in it and we build a foundation on it and we try to protect it and then we hoard it and we start eyeing people. What, or they want a piece of this, huh? They want to, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't give this away because I won't have, right? And that's, that's what happens. Um, and what this passage does is it strips us of self-reliance. God aims to bring us to a place of weakness so that we can receive Strength, which brings us to the last observation. Um, God both does feats of strength and delights in the feats of strength that he does. And this, all this is pointing to one person, all right? So you look at Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, and what you begin to find out is that what's at stake in this passage is not necessarily the way God acts within the universe, uh, but rather what God does in a person, in a particular person, in time and in place, in space, um, and John read about him today. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I'm the Lord who practices, so God does, right? Steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So that's the second observation. God does particular feats of strength, namely steadfast love righteousness, and justice. And not only does he do those things, he delights in them. Like Jonathan said, we all like a feat of strength. How many of you like sports of some sort? Just a few of you, a couple of you, yeah. What, you know, what is it that we like about sports? Besides, you know, vic there's a lot of things. Vicariously living through another team or experiencing success based on affiliation, but... Well, at the heart of sports is a demonstration of what? Anybody know? Ability, talent, 
strength. I mean, when Tony watches his skateboarding competitions, um, what, what, that's what's on display. It's the pure ability of someone to carry out something and comparing that to sometimes your own inability, right? That's what I love about golf is I see these guys hit shots and I know how hard it is because I've actually put a club in my hand and tried to hit those shots. It doesn't work. It doesn't, my, my balls don't do that. They don't do what, the, I mean, they just don't. They, they, they don't, they don't do that. We love demonstrations of strength, but so does the Lord. Um, and what the Lord is out to, to show us is, is that his demonstration of strength, right? His demonstration of strength is, is much different than ours. Let's look at 1 Corinthians uh, 1 one more time. Here's what Paul says in verse 18. He says, The word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discer- discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of the world, and for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's look at that again. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the, what's it say? Power of God and the wisdom of God. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Paul you know, he's going to quote this. He's going to quote Jeremiah 9 at the very end, right? Let the one who boasts, boast in the world. Uh, bo- let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, rather. Um, what Paul has done is he's taken this verse and he has actually said, okay, the manifestation of God's power is who? Jesus Christ. The manifestation of God's wisdom is Jesus Christ. The manifestation of God's riches and wealth is Jesus Christ. For you know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who, even though he was rich, for your sake became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And so what Paul has done is he's taken Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, that highlight the foolish boasting of the the strength of of men, the wisdom of men, and the wealth of men. It says, rather, you should boast in God. And then he gives it content, namely Christ as the power of God, Christ as the wisdom from God, Christ as the riches, the fullness of the riches of God. And, and, and he says, what God has done, the way God has manifested, steadfast love, mercy, um, righteousness, is that he's actually done it in a person. And so when, we, when it comes time to boast in the Lord, we make our boast in the manifestation of all the things that we boast wrongly in in humans, namely Christ, power from God, wisdom from God, wealth from God. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of God, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And all of that comes full circle and applies to us in a very profound way. Namely, this. God doesn't use strong people. He just doesn't. 
And even the ones that he does use, it's not the kind of strength you'd expect. One strong person God used in the Old Testament, who is it? Samson. Y'all think Samson looked like Nick or Zeke? I don't. I think he probably looked like Adam. Adam in the back there. You know, the, the reason I think that is because, do you remember what all the Philistines said when Samson would break out against them? Where does this guy get his strength from? Well, guys, if Samson looked like me, there'd be no doubt where he got it from, right? <laughs> That's why I think you look like Adam. <laughs> no one knew where his strength came from. And you go through the story of Samson and you see Samson acting out of his strength. But ultimately, the way that God got victory over Dagon and over the Philistines' gods is when Samson was what? Brought low at his weakest. You know, his strength was in his hair. And then he went to Delilah's spa. And got a haircut, and it, and it went away. And, and so, you know, so he's there, right? And, and the, 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 the epitome of strength in the Old Testament that we see is Samson. And one of the, one of the takeaways from the story is, is that God is most glorified in Samson, not when he's, you know, in our minds, ripped, long, flowing black hair, kind of looks like Tarzan, you know, <laughs> looking for his Jane. That's, no. It's when the head is shaved, there's no, there's no apparent strength at all. And he calls on God to use a weak vessel to bring it all, to, to bring everything down, right? And so when we, when we get to the point in our lives, right, where everything is crumbling, I mean, Anthony's been there, right? What do you do? I mean, you don't, there's uncertainty. How's this surgery going to go? What's going to happen? Will I be able to lead a normal life after? There's just there's all these things, right? And what you what you find is when you come to some of these things in degrees, you know, I can't. A lot of people have a lot worse than me, right? I'm having trouble with my hands. It's a degree. So it's just what you're trying to find is you're trying to find contentment in whatever that place that God has you is in the moment, and and accept that as as a vehicle for, for strength and for power. Anthony, have you ever been stronger spiritually? No. Ever. And it was when he had to have his cancer removed and the bone removed and put up here. And all that, like, and then God shows up in, in ways that he's never experienced him before, right? And, and, when, you, and when you look at, at Scripture and you look at the person of Jesus Christ, then it actually begins to make sense. This is, what, this is the way God works. So when Christ comes, we're told in Isaiah 53 that he grew up as a shoot from the ground. There was nothing about him that was desirable to look at. Not the epitome of human strength, not the epitome of human wisdom. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to the world that he created and he was in the world and the world rejected him, right? There, there's nothing endearing about this person of Christ except that when he was weak, God was strong. And, and, when you, and you see that, that mindset carry through. So let's, let's end with this. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And because look, everybody's got their own weakness, right? Everybody has their own and that's the way it's going to work. It's going to work this way. Like, and it could be, it could be your physical health. It could be um, the way things are going in your marriage. It, it could be anything. But 2 Corinthians 12, and this is, this is verse 9, right? Actually, let's start. Let's, let's start um, in verse 5. Well, I'll give you a little bit of the background. Um, Paul here is talking about some revelations that he's had. Um, and so he's been called up to the third heaven, whether in body or out of body, he doesn't know, God knows. 
Um, he's been caught up into paradise, verse three. Whether in the body or out of body, I don't know, God knows. Paul's heard many things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I wish to boast, I would not be a fool, verse six, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And so I don't know what it is. A lot of people have, there's a lot of guesses. I, I don't know, I really don't. Um, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And so what we have in verse nine suddenly is a shift of thinking at the therefore. Because all of us have been in verse eight. How many of you have been in a situation that you have pleaded God to get you out of? That if you could just fix it or something would happen, that, that you would actually be better off, right? So we've all been there. We've all been there. And then verse nine, something after, after this word comes from God, from Christ, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. There's a therefore. And you know, this is old and cliche, but whenever you see a therefore, the question you should ask is, what is it there for? I mean, that's just, Bob, like that, that's how you, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, listen to this, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And one of the things I opened up with was using the word accept. One of the things I did when my little, you know, piddly, idiopathic, inflammatory myopathy because in the grand scheme of things, it is. One of the things that I did, people said, what did you do when it first happened? Well, one of the things I did when it first happened, besides going, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong with me, you know, was I began trying to accept it as what it, as, as what it was and not worrying about and trying to figure out and getting all upset about what it used to be. And I think that, that is probably the harder place and the harder thing to do. And I'm not, look, I'm not, I'm by no means, um, I'm like, I try to be like what Paul tells of Timothy, set, set a good example in conduct and in speech and in all other things. I, I'm, I'm, ser- I'm flawed. But that is where I spent most of my time is trying to accept the, the weakness that I had for what it was. Knowing that, okay, hey, I, I do need to go to the doctor and get it looked at. He, you, know, you know, this is strange, this is weird, right? But ultimately, at the end of the day, you, I'm, I was reminded that, you know, my hands, are, the use of these weren't, aren't a guarantee. Now, I could fool myself into thinking that they are or that it is, but in reality, it's not. It's the Lord doesn't promise me that. That's not why Christ came and died. He didn't come and die so I had a full use of my limbs. He didn't come and die so that I could pull my pants up in the morning. He didn't come and die so I could write. That, that, that's not what he offers me. What he offers me is supernatural strength through whatever weakness I'm going through in Christ Jesus. As, I, as Paul says, the words he uses, right? For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses. What I think he means there is I accept these as what they are. I accept these as what they are. I don't, I don't put all of my energy in, anymore into trying to change a weakness that I feel like hinders me. Rather, I accept this as what it is and say, I serve a God who uses weaknesses to showcase his strength. And and that's where we're all, 
eventually have to get. That, that's where we're all going. That is the fight of faith when you take your last breath. So people on their deathbed, they fight to the end. And the fight of, of faith is believing that, right? The last, you hear old cliche, last breath on earth is the first one in eternity. That God's ultimate power is, if his power is showcased in weakness, the ultimate display of weakness is is. It's death, but that in Christ Jesus, even death has been defeated in such a way that it showcases the immeasurable power of God's glorious resurrection. And that's, and that's where we're all going. And that's where we're all, and, 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 the, and the reason that it's important to know that's where we're all going now is because I think that sometimes we think of the Christian life as, as magic too much, Right? Like we somehow think that we're going to actually get to the end and be okay with that. And yet we can't accept any of the weaknesses that we're going through in the moment. And I think the Bible confronts us with this reality in a gracious way. And it says, it doesn't work like that. And that's why we have the body of Christ to surround us. That's why we have friends that pray. People to tell us the truth about a situation and say, hey, Sometimes the first step in actually changing a situation is accepting it. It's finding absolute contentment in it. It's, it's letting go of it and stop trying to push it and pull it and letting, and letting God do what he wants to it saying, hey, you know, if, if this is a weakness that he will not take away, then he, sh- he will showcase his power in it. And what my, my, as a person, right, my charge is to find ultimate joy, satisfaction, contentment, and rest in the person of Christ so that as the God of comfort, right, as, as the, who is the God of comfort, as, as our, our God probably pretty much is comfort, but as, as that false God's being exposed and we are dealing with things that make things uncomfortable, whether it be work situation, arms burning, why can't I, you know, I will load the car while my arms still, whatever it is, right? Intimacy in your marriage, whatever it is, right? What it, that you're, the God, the, the idol in you is cause for comfort solution. Well, our job is to, is to run to Christ, the God of all comfort, and to submit ourselves as what we are, fully accepting that this is, this is the vessel that I am with all of its weaknesses. Have, have your way. Have your way. And so those are some things that I thought about this week and that I struggled with. Um, and I did not struggle with them that well when I couldn't put my shorts on. You know, I was not like, oh, I'm a broken vessel. And your strength will be made perfect in my weakness, right? You know, no, I cussed and kicked and acted like a little kid and, you know, and cried on Beth and said, oh, what if I'm going to live like, right? And then I went and regained, and then I went for a walk and said, you know, man, I sure have wasted a lot of time with my arms and hands. I mean, what else can you say at some point, right? I mean, you're confronted with the reality and you go for a walk and you say, well, if this is all I get, man, I sure fouled that up. Sorry. Um, and, and you try to accept and you try to receive it, right? But that's what the cross gives us power to do. That's what the cross gives us power to do. And I'm gonna stop talking here. I mean, I've already filled up my sermon outline like I've done my clothes. But that's what the cross gives us power to do. The cross isn't the power to fix all your problems. It, do, it just doesn't work that way. The cross gives us the power through the grace of God to accept the things that we must accept so that we can actually humble ourselves and give space for God and for people, for all the things to actually work out the way that God's gonna work them out and us not control it, right? And that's, that's he didn't die on the cross as a means of manipulation so that we can invoke it and pray for it and lay hands for it and anoint for it and get what we want for it. That's not, 
what the cross does. It gives us the power to take our hands off of it and to say, I have hands that I need help lifting something. I can't do it. And, and, and that's one of the most beautiful things about the gospel is that it allows us actually to discover who God is and who we are and actually grow in the pursuit of that. Let's just pray together. God, we're thankful for the way that you love us. I'm thankful for um, the patience that you've given as these people have listened to me try to find my way this morning. We pray just for, we thank you that you are a God who uses weak vessels to showcase your strength, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to, you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to help us just to, to go deeper into who we are in you, our identity in Christ Jesus, the ultimate display of your strength, of your sovereign strength in someone who was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows filled with our shame, our guilt, our sin, hung upon, enthroned upon a cross, crowned with thorns. Yet King of kings, Lord of lords, power. Bring this to fruition in our lives, God. Give us love for one another, Lord. I pray for those who are lost, who don't know Jesus, that you would grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, that you would remind them that he died for their trespasses and sins and rose for their justification. Lord, we're thankful for who you are. Lord, I pray that you would help us to accept, to be content with weaknesses, with insults, with hardships, so that the power, your power may rest on us. For when we are weak, you are strong. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, say it every week. I'll be down front here if you want prayer um, or if you want to come and pray. This is open to you. And um, let's stand. We'll sing this last song together.